On today's episode, I'm joined by the New York Times best-selling author of Neurotribes. He goes into detail about the underreported history of autism, decodes common misconceptions in the field of mental health, and discusses the potential future of neurodiversity. So without further ado, here is my conversation with author Steve Silberman, and this is Uncovering the Truth. Steve, I want to start out with a broad question. What were some of the experiences and readings that you had to do in order to write Neurotribes? Because that's a pretty unique subject to take on. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, here's the thing. Uh, I was raised in a, uh, liberal is probably too weak a word, uh, household Mm -hmm. um, by uh, anti-racist, anti-anti-Semitic, uh, you know, pro-labor uh, family. So my father was uh, the president of his teachers union, et cetera. And then in uh, probably junior high school, I discovered uh, the poetry of Allen Ginsberg. And uh, Allen Ginsberg was a member of the so-called beat generation of American writers that also included Jack Kerouac and Gary Snyder. And Allen's best poem is this book length poem called Kaddish. Uh, which is the name of the Hebrew prayer for the dead. And he wrote it about his mother who had schizophrenia and who um, died in an asylum uh, after a botched lobotomy. So that book made a very deep impression on me when I was young, as did actually even before that, before junior high school, I read a book called Flowers for Algernon by Daniel Keyes, which was the fictitious journal of a um, young man with intellectual disability who was given a brain enhancing uh, experimental operation. And so he becomes non-disabled for a while and then becomes disabled again. And both of those um, uh, very compassionate views of people who are really ignored by society um, you know, in the case of Ellen's mother, she was, uh, she had schizophrenia and she was, you know, sort of put through the mill of brutal uh, psychiatric interventions. Uh, and then Flowers for Algernon was like this science fiction story about this guy who, you know, um, was also uh, bullied and ignored by society because of his cognitive disability. Both mm-hmm. of those um works made a really deep impression on me and prepared me to see autism uh, in a slightly different way than um, most historians had before. Um, And I I quickly figured out while writing Neurotribes that the official history of autism, as it was reiterated in thousands of textbooks and Wikipedia, was wrong. And when I started writing about autism, there was this false belief that autism was an epidemic, um, that it was being caused by vaccines, um, all the stuff mm. that you're still hearing <laughs> kind yeah. of now, unfortunately. Same conspiracies <laughs> about other ailments in society. Exactly. And literally, you know, the, the energy of, uh, you know, anti-maskers and anti-vaccine people, it was very much the same in autism when I started writing about autism uh, back in the year 2001. And I wrote Neurotribes because society had gone from thinking of autism as a very, very rare condition, um, Mm -hmm. which is what everyone thought back in 2001 when I started writing about it, to suddenly, you know, there were all these autistic people everywhere and autistic people um, started showing, you know, kind of stereotypes. Uh, visions of autistic people started showing up in popular media, but everybody was obsessed with the wrong thing, um, which was they were obsessed with vaccines, which turned out to be, you know, a complete hoax Um, or, uh, you know, too much screen time for kids or whatever. Uh, And when I started doing the research, I figured out that if you knew the accurate timeline of autism's discovery, which was not the one that was in all those textbooks and Wikipedia, that you would understand why the number of diagnoses started going up so steeply 
in the 1990s and that it was actually a good thing because it was uh, what I like to call an epidemic of recognition of actually recognizing that there were all these people on the spectrum who were getting no help, no services, no support, no transition programs out of high school into the job market, et cetera. Um, and so that's why I wrote Neurotrimes because the question of what was causing that steep rise um, in diagnoses in the 90s had not been answered in the mainstream media. And so that's why I wrote Neurotribes. And, and so that's right. I, I was looking that until the 1990s, the autism diagnoses were very seldom, if not rare or, or were ever diagnosed. Yet I saw in an interview you gave for The Sun that you talked about the Nazis Action T4, which was their secret extermination program that, that sent autistic schizophrenia and likewise um people with epilepsy into, as well people, yeah yeah back to yeah. extermination so uh, i mean this has been prevalent in society yet and, and again your book so your goal here with the book if i'm understanding is to bring an awareness back to say this is a major part of our society that we've neglected for a very long time right well one of the main um you know my my um book opens with a very, very in-depth profile of a, um, a guy who was an incredibly important uh, scientist, Henry Cavendish, uh, before the word scientist was even invented. He was right. what was called a nat uh, natural philosopher. And he was also very mm -hmm. clearly autistic. I was um, blessed with the fact that there were lots of um, accounts by his contemporaries of his behavior and also two noted authorities on autism, Uta Frith and, and uh, Oliver Sacks, the author of Anthropologist on Mars and other fascinating books about the brain, um, mm -hmm. had both retro-diagnosed him. So I didn't, um, you know, take the bold step of retro-diagnosing anyone. Mm -hmm. um, I was mm -hmm. working off their, you know, their acknowledged experts. And so I just wanted to point out that autistic people had been playing essential roles in the creation of not just science, but culture and art um, for centuries. And, uh, but they were just unrecognized as autistic and unrecognized as needing support. And so, yes, in uh, World War II, um, or actually in the 30s before World War II, there was a group of uh, clinicians in Vienna Austria. Um, Hans Asperger was only one of them. Uh, two others were George Frankel and Annie Weiss, who were virtually unknown until Neurotribes came out. They were both Jewish and, and they were Asperger's collaborators. And they developed a very compassionate, very broad-minded view of autism. And they thought that autistic people were everywhere. In fact, Hans Asperger once said, once you wow. learn to recognize the distinctive traits of autism, you see them everywhere, which I think is where we are now. Um, and, mm. you know, the so-called spectrum model of autism is what accounts for that steep increase in uh, diagnoses in the 90s. And they, they called it the autistic continuum. So they had a very, very uh -huh. um, advanced view of what autism was and a very broad one that included both geniuses um, and people who needed 24 seven support and maybe couldn't talk, uh, particularly without iPads that, you know, that now help some nonverbal autistic people talk um, or non-speaking, I shouldn't say nonverbal. But, um, you know, so, so that was known in the thirties. There was a, actually a previous description in Russia by a woman named Grunya Sukareva of uh, a bunch of teenagers who she writes hilariously about. They're actually seem like wonderful kids. Um, and she was noticing uh, people with what would later have been called Asperger syndrome uh, way back in the early part of the 20th century. So autistic people have always been here. The question is how well do we see them? And the problem is that Asperger's clinic was eventually taken over by the Nazis. 
um, when the mm. Germans marched into Austria in 1938 for the so-called Anschluss, um, Asperger's bosses, if they weren't Nazis already, became Nazis. And um, Action T4 was a secret extermination program for kids with hereditary disabilities that emanated from, you know, Hitler and Berlin uh, for the purpose of eugenics to try to, you know, improve the human gene pool by eliminating mm. people carrying these hereditary disabilities. And so Asperger's uh, pioneering paper, to say nothing of the papers of George Frankel and Annie Weiss, were sort of ignored uh, after the war, um, particularly by this guy, Leo Connor, who claimed to be the discoverer of autism. And unlike Asperger and his colleagues, defined autism very, very narrowly as basically non-speaking kids. He had a million um, constraints on, on mm -hmm. giving out the diagnosis. So most of the people who got the diagnosis under Connor were like the children of yuppies, sort of very aggressive uh, people. And so, yeah. yeah, and so Connor's definition prevailed uh, throughout the 20th century, this very narrow, uh, you know, if a kid looked intellectually disabled, they wouldn't get the diagnosis. Whereas Asperger and Frankel and Weiss's much broader and in fact, much more accurate definition was forgotten. And so what happened in the 90s was that we figured out that that uh, Asperger and Frankel and Weiss's vision was correct. Wow. I, oh, so if I, if I could just take this in, if I also recall, uh, Asperger was advocating uh, to spare these individuals from the Nazis' wrath due to the fact that they had an enhanced pattern recognition skills and code-breaking abilities. And so one of the, the interesting point about this notion is that there seems to be some inherent superpower or at least some mental super ability that a lot of autistic individuals share. I, I know I spoke with you previously about this. There was a student in my high school who had been diagnosed with autism and he had a profound ability where you could ask him to name any date on the calendar, even in the year 2430 january 2nd and <laughs> within three seconds he would tell you that goes on a tuesday or a thursday and he would get it right a hundred percent of the time so in my opinion there there is some latent untapped potential in the human brain that it seems to me that only they are capable of and what are your thoughts on that well uh yeah that's called uh that's a really classic you know autistic trait um it's called calendar calculation. Um, wow. Not only autistic people have it, but uh, and certainly not every autistic person has right. it at all, particularly as the definition has gotten broader. There's the problem with saying um, that, oh, this trait is a superpower, is that it's a way of sort of getting around uh, ableism which is, you know, viewing mm. autistic people as less than. It says, no, they're not less than. They're actually more than, you know. But some right. autistic people, you know, me, me, I would say the vast majority of autistic people cannot do calendar calculation. The vast majority of autistic people um, cannot, uh, you know, necessarily um, perform extraordinarily well in some area of science or technology. And uh, you know, Elon Musk claims to be autistic, and maybe he is. That's his right to do that. Um, he's certainly not <laughs> showing a superpower as a moderator of a of a huge, passionate community. He's a mess. Um, right. So, right. so, you know, there's a little bit of danger in, you know, just as autistic people were stereotyped for most of the 20th century, as you know, less than human, in fact, literally not human. Yeah. One of the uh, leading uh, horrible behavioral therapists named uh, Ivar Lovas, who also, by the way, ran um, conversion therapy for gay kids. Um, and he, he was literally a torturer. He used electric shocks and uh, loud sounds, which are particularly awful 
uh, for uh, people who are very sensitive to sound, um, like many autistic people. Um, he said, uh, you have to, you know, he basically said, there's no person there in an autistic person. You have to build the person with these brutal therapies. Oh. And um, his work with autistic kids was very much tied in with his conversion of gay kids. And, you know, one of the, the one of the kids who became sort of the star of Lovas's gay conversion program. Uh, and, you know, there were like 10 papers written about him ended up committing suicide. So that wasn't a very successful course of therapy, if you ask me. Um, so, yes, it, it's very appropriate to look at what autistic people, mm -hmm. some autistic people can do very well. And, for example, um, the Israeli government uses uh, a team of autistic data analysts to analyze satellite data because they have very precise um, perceptions of little changes in photographs and stuff like that. So there are definitely mm. groups of autistic people who have very special talents. And yes, you know, those talents have been wasted. I mean, many of the, um, that's what, yeah, I was yeah. just more upset. I think wasted yeah. and, yeah. uh, neglected, ignored, yeah. and yeah. it makes me angry. I just, yeah, that was my, and, and just and just to uh, retouch about this scientist, is this uh, applied behavioral analysis (ABA)? Is this what you're talking it about? It is. It is. And um, there was actually a wonderful article in the Boston Globe. I, I can't recall the author's name, unfortunately, about ABA, but it was just published last week. It's one of the most hmm. thoroughgoing and honest and kind of devastating um articles about aba i've ever read the problem with aba which um uh you know is based on lovas's work uh is that it's often presented to parents as sort of the only possible hope for their autistic kid and it's suggested to them at a point when really any kid autistic or not would be struggling to learn a lot of basic skills and so uh, the ABA industry, which is very well organized, um, you know, convinces state legislatures that this is essential. It's the only game in town. It isn't. There are other more humane forms of uh, uh, therapy for autistic kids, like something called CERTs. Um, I would very much recommend a book called, um, oh, damn, what is it called? I'm sorry, Barry Present, Uniquely Human, A Different Way of Seeing Autism, mm. which is about this much more humane way of looking at autistic behavior. And cheaper. Um, yeah, right, it is. Yeah, ABA is very expensive. And autistic people who have been through ABA, many of them report that it was completely traumatic. And wow. um, so, yeah. But, right, so these, you know, one of the things that I did while writing Neurotribes was... Uh, <laughs> It was almost like a game in my mind. Find the hidden autistic people in history. And so I discovered that just like three blocks up from my apartment here in San Francisco, there was a, a mental asylum called Langley Porter. Um, and in the 60s and 70s, they had an epidemic of childhood schizophrenia. Well, childhood schizophrenia was autism. Uh, and in fact, the diagnostic criteria for childhood schizophrenia were just incorporated wholesale into autism. Meanwhile, we now recognize that childhood schizophrenia is in fact quite rare, whereas autism is quite common. So there were hundreds of autistic kids three blocks from here in a, mm -hmm. in a mental asylum um, and wow. uh, you know being subjected to all kinds of brutal stuff. Um, so anyway, there were lots of autistic people. There always have been. And they were either shut away in places like Langley Porter in Bellevue in New York, or they were, you know, the weird uncle who was always talks about World War II, a specific battle at Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> um, and, uh, so right. uh, they were either actively excluded and, you know, pathologized as uh, having, you know, some terrible um, condition or sort of quietly excluded through bullying and uh, ignoring um, and just not given an opportunity 
to play a meaningful role in society. So one of the things I wanted to do was to advocate for um, uh, people with autism playing a meaningful role in society by learning how to turn their very focused interests mm -hmm. into potential careers. Wow. And I know one of the, the things you do is you advocate and you engage with the autistic community online, which you've noted is, is it's, it's a way for, for them to learn communication as well through this technology. Now, I want to bring up another point here, because is the use of social media, particularly right now where there's so much stimulation, now we have an uptick in hate speech, as we know, Twitter is now a hotbed for this sort of amplified rhetoric, let alone the fact that that it, it makes neurotypical people, you know, drives us to anxiety, depression, loneliness. Is this yeah. a healthy environment for the autistic <clears throat> community or ask broadly asking for, for anyone? Well, what's interesting is that you just said, you know, it's a way for the autistic community to learn how to communicate. It's also a way for me to learn how to communicate with the autistic community, because oh um, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, many neurotypical people carry around assumptions about what autistic people are like, what they're capable of. Many of these, um, you know, are sort of dim views of people. For instance, one of the most prominent myths about about autistic people is that they don't get humor or they don't get sarcasm. In fact, some of the most gifted you know, cutting, mm -hmm. uh, sarcastic people I know I've met on Twitter and they're autistic. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I actually, I'll tell you a story. You know, one of the reasons why neurotribes, um, was seen as something new and was very much embraced by the autistic community, which they would not, you know, I was not counting on. I didn't think that maybe that would happen. Because if you think of, I mean, I'm not autistic, I'm neurotypical, right? So, it, you know, right. a neurotypical writing a book about autism is not unusual, um, but it's kind of like, you know, imagine if you're writing this, you know, history of feminism, but you're a man and you're, you're man, only quoting right? men, you know? So I very much tried to invite the autistic community to have input into the direction and shape of my book. And I'm very, very grateful to them for that. And I did that partly uh, by talking to autistic people on Twitter, finding out what they really struggle with in their day-to-day -day lives and what they really celebrate in their day-to-day -day lives. Mm. Um, not looking at them as like, uh, you know, just people with this medical condition. That was the biggest arc of evolution for me personally um, during writing Neurotribes was I went from, you know, thinking, oh, I'm writing about a diagnosis to I actually came to believe that I was writing about a tribe of people, if you were, who were, who were uh, you know, on this road to autonomy and civil rights and demanding that they have a seat at the table when autism policy is set and all that. And so th I, I do think that my being gay was helpful in that regard because i had been through you know a kind of similar experience around gayness in that when i was in high school homosexuality was considered a mental disorder it was listed in the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders the bible of psychiatry and the international classification of diseases if I had been caught, you know, making out with my boyfriend in high school, not that I had any, but if I had been caught you know, <laughs> making out with my boyfriend in high school, I could have been sent to either jail or uh, an asylum. Um, and uh, so what changed that was not, oh, scientists have announced that homosexuality turns out not to be a mental disorder after all. No, that's not what happened. What happened was a bunch of activists... Uh, did what they called zaps where they would descend on like you know some office of the american psychiatric association and say enough of this you know stop treating us like we're mentally ill and then gay therapists started coming out um i mean when i was a, when i was a yeah, kid wow wow yeah it was very powerful it was a very powerful very in your face um 
aggressive uh, effort to overturn the medical model of homosexuality. And it worked. It worked in my lifetime. So now I, you know, I'm married. I have a wonderful husband. Um, uh, congratulations. And, uh, yeah. Uh, what yeah, a, what a, I just got to interject here. What, a, what an yeah. amazing journey. And if I could just ask you maybe a personal question, this, bring, sure. this brings, brings it up. You brought it up. Sure. How do you feel that the modern day discourse is affecting as well the LGBTQ community? I, I see us as going backwards. Uh -huh. Particularly with the the right wing politicians who are calling mm -hmm. for the banning of gender affirming care, oh, yeah. rem the removal of LGBTQ themed books. Right. To me, I, I I fear for our fellow LGBTQ community brothers and sisters who now have to grow up in a society where the most powerful people in the country are sending the message that you received in school that you have a mental disorder and that what you are doing is is inhuman. Which oh, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And it's very much, I must say, it's, you know, I mean, I'm cynical and, 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 uh, you know, uh, only optimistic within certain <laughs> boundaries. But oh, my God, this groomer stuff. It's a classic homophobia, like going back to the Nazis, like it, it, Nazis, yeah, yeah. you know, believe that homosexuality was a mental disorder that was spread by groomers, you know. I mean, it's literally, it's yeah, classic. Yeah. All, Liberal all, ideology. Yeah, exactly. All yeah. the greatest hits of the Nazi movement and fascism are being brought back into the mainstream by Donald Trump and his fellow Republicans. That's just straight up. It's not my opinion. That's what they're saying. And so when a bunch of freaking stormtroopers show up at a library because, uh, you know, a drag queen is reading children's stories there. I mean, it's like, find a real problem to work on, uh, dudes. You know, we get that you love running around with American flags and guns and stuff. But it's like, you know, a drag queen reading a children's story to a room full of kids is not going to um, do anything to their, you know. I mean, if, if uh, peer pressure worked, I would be straight, you know, um, <laughs> exactly. So, right. <laughs> you know, so anyway, yeah, no, I, I, I think I'm horrified by what's going on with the attacks on the LGBTQ community and they're completely enabled by Republican bigots and Tucker Carlson, who is one of the, you know, obviously one of the most successful cable news anchors in the world he is right. he's a freak show. Um, he in his college yearbook, he literally name checked the assassin of Harvey Milk, the gay uh, San Francisco supervisor, uh, and also uh, Jesse Helms, the most infamously homophobic senator, uh, you know, from the 70s or whatever. Tucker Carlson is is a maniac who, you know, sits there looking all boyish with his ties yep. and stuff while mouthing straight up Nazi ideology into millions of living rooms from coast to coast. It, yes. And there's no check on that as well. And, and one of the, the, what I like about your work <laughs> is that you've brought a historical perspective to this underrepresented community. Now, at least from my experience in school, I did political, I'm currently doing political science and history. Through all the books I've read, there have not been any mentions of autism or uh, these intellectual impairments that we're speaking of. And I, I, I again, I imagine um, if I were to be reading this as not neuroatypical, you would, you would feel that, hey, I, I'm not being represented in history and what an interesting uh, dilemma we're in. Do, 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 does the education system need to do a better job of addressing this aspect of society? Well, the, the good thing is that now um, a bunch of autistic people are writing books about their own community. In fact, I have one right here, actually. There's a guy named uh, Eric Garcia. Uh, who is a, a reporter mm. for The Independent and The Washington Post and a bunch of other newspapers. He wrote a book called We're Not Broken. It's excellent. It's a, a sort of an overview mm. of um, how the autistic community is starting to shape 
policy and um, to to demand a seat at the table when those decisions are made. Uh, he's pointed out to me that uh, both um, Hillary and Biden um, actually approached autistic adults when they were writing their disability platforms, which is the complete opposite of you know what the GOP did with Donald Trump mocking this disabled reporter at the podium. Oh, um, yeah. And so things are changing and autistic people are now taking a prominent role in describing that change. And I, that's one of the things that's happened since my book has come out that I think has been really hopeful. Like even with all the Trump nightmare and, the, and now the Elon Musk nightmare, um, there have been several movies that are actually like the best movies ever made about autism, like right now. Uh, one of them is a Pixar short called Loop, which is about a uh, non-speaking uh, uh, Black autistic girl um, because Leo wow. Connor, the, the clinician I mentioned earlier, basically described autistic people as white and rich. Um, just having a Black uh, yeah. female autistic character is a step forward, and she was played by an autistic voice actor. So that's really, uh, you know, a step forward. There's another um, documentary. It's harder to find, but it's worth finding called uh, This Is Not About Me, about a young woman named Jordan Zimmerman. Again, it's great to have autistic representation of a, a woman uh, with autism. Um, she was completely, uh, you know, being thrown away by her teachers in uh, elementary school. She was violent. She was self-injurious. She was very angry. Uh, her parents were told to put her in an asylum and forget about her. Um, but instead, Jordan found a, uh, a very sympathetic group of teachers who enabled her to use an iPad to communicate. Once she could communicate, she was no longer so angry. You know, wouldn't you be too if you couldn't communicate? Yeah, and right. She, she just got a degree, a master's degree in special education. So instead of wasting away in a mental asylum, she got a master's degree in special education. Um, so that film is called This Is Not About Me. And um, another uh, film is called uh, The Reason I Jump, um, which gives you a cross-cultural view of autism in various societies all over the world. And so in a way, we're sort of in a golden age of yeah, well. autistic content. Um, even as, you know, other aspects of society look very dark right now. But, yeah. And, and speaking perhaps of some of the darker aspects, not, not to bring down the mood for the listeners here, yeah. but y you know, that's what I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> there is a, uh, uh, one of the interesting points you, you brought up in your son interview once again, uh, you said technology that encourages us to text instead of talking face to face has somewhat perpetuated a world that has become slightly more autistic. I'm, I'm just curious here. Yeah. Uh, what are, uh, one I, of the I, things. Yeah. Oh, and please. just sorry, really to, to add on to that, yeah. not in a, not in a negative way, mm -hmm. but simply in a way where uh, you, we are not communicating as much with each other because these screens are so much more easier for us to do, but mm -hmm. easier does not mean better. And I mm -hmm. fear that we're losing human connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, even though I've been, you know got on the internet in the early '90s and stuff, I'm still, you know, uh, like weighing the various factors in whether or not, you know, we've on the whole lost something or gained something. For instance, mm -hmm. Dash. Let's face it. What are the chances that you and I would ever have spoken if it wasn't for the internet? You know, it, exactly so, right. Uh, and, you know, it's I mean, good, it's I, a good point. Yeah. And, you know, for autistic people, one of the things that I write about in Neurotribes is that um, for many autistic people who, um, you know, if they if they have to make eye contact in the conversation, it drains their cognitive resources. So it's harder for them to absorb the information. Right. Um, many of them often want to reconsider their statements before firing them off you know so it's like if you're in a live conversation there's no time for that uh live conversations very much favor neurotypicality in a way um mm -hmm. 
And so for many autistic people, the advent of the internet was completely groundbreaking and liberating. And plus they could talk to each other, you know? And one of the most poignant moments in the research for my book actually, was when I started reading early um, uh, kind of email lists about uh, autism with autistic people in the conversation. At that point, there was barely a diagnosis of autism that was available to adults. It was thought of, still thought of as a form of childhood psychosis, you know? And so I, I saw autistic people figuring out in real time that they were still autistic. You know, they would say, well, when I was young, you know, Leo Connor, you know, uh -huh. diagnosed me or whatever. But is it possible that I still have autism? You know, and um, yes, it is possible. And so they literally had to discover who uh -huh. they were by talking to each other. So I don't think there's, you know, anything bad about that. I think it's great. Um, and in fact, I'm, you know, one of the things I'm upset about uh, re-Twitter is that the autistic community has been so... Um, successful at making their own space on Twitter, uh, it's going to be, hard, you know, you can't just say like, okay, everybody go off to Mastodon or whatever, you know, it's You're like, right. it's going to be hard for some people to, to um, create that same intense international community uh, on another forum. But, you know, as of this morning, we have Elon, you know, uh, tweeting Pepe the frog memes. <laughs> um, which so, is yeah that's from like the 4chan website right or something. Right, exactly. right and um, so i guess social media okay great there's great benefits to it for the community uh, yeah. unden undeniably uh but just for for uh the society on the whole though mm -hmm. that is an in interesting dilemma where we're we're just given such easy access to virtual communities that right um, per perhaps sometimes it's healthy to step away from it all Right. Um, you know, one thing I think about, I hardly ever see this mentioned, actually, but, you know, I assume that at some point I'll be one of the surviving people on Earth who remembers <laughs> what it was like before the Internet. I and know, it's crazy. It's wild, isn't it? And one of the things that I think about is before the Internet, you could really be bored. You know, it's like if you didn't have a, a book you wanted yeah. to read lying around, if your friend wasn't calling you, if the person you had a crush on wasn't calling you, you know, or, you yeah. know, if you were just happened to be alone somewhere, what was there to do? You know, well, in fact, you know, you could maybe think up a poem or paint a picture or stuff like that. We never have that downtime anymore. You no. know, it's like as soon as you and I finish this conversation, I'll be like, oh, my God, did somebody text me while, you know, <laughs> while I had right. do not disturb on, you know? And, you know, when I'm reading, you know, Twitter in bed when I'm supposed to be sleeping because it's four in the morning and I'm anxious about, you know, Trump or Elon or something. It's like, I'm never bored. <laughs> Had quite no. the opposite problem. Right. We're always yeah. informed and stimulated now. And right. Yeah, that's that's another thing, especially because I I'm I grew up on social media. I mm -hmm. use it all the time. Yet I yeah. always feel a and I've spoke about this on previous podcasts yeah. uh, with Doctor Stephen Hassan particularly. Oh, cool. And yeah. it was just uh, we're like, you know what? The the human connection is, is disappearing as we dive deeper into this technology. But we need to cultivate a healthy relationship and. Right. So that's why I, I love you, the work you do. And speaking of the work you do, your new book, which you're currently working on called Taste of Salt, is about cystic fibrosis. So how did you go from autism to cystic fibrosis as your next subject as an author? Yeah, well, um, here's the deal. Um, when, uh, when Neurotribes came out, the first question that practically everybody asked me from media to, you know, people at my readings or whatever was, oh, do you have an autistic kid? And uh, it kind of bugged me because it was like, um, what, would no one write, you know, I'm a science writer. Would no one write about autism if they didn't have a kid, you know? But I, I but I was, <laughs> I was smart crazy. enough to know where that was question was coming from. That question was coming from the outdated model of autism as super rare. Like the only time anybody would ever write a book about it would be if they had skin in the game, you know? 
So uh, I didn't have skin in the game, but um, but I wrote it anyway because I'm a science writer. With cystic fibrosis, the opposite is true. One of my best friends has cystic fibrosis, and what and cystic fibrosis for those who don't know is a, a genetic uh, inheritable. Um, very, very serious condition that affects virtually every um, system or cell in your body. Um, and it uh, produces all kinds of difficulties, including um, repeated series of lung infections. Um, and cystic fibrosis, 20 years ago even, was considered inevitably terminal. Um, and, you know, 40 years ago, kids with cystic fibrosis would live maybe a year or two. So when I figured out that one of my best friends, a guy, Phil Weissar, has cystic fibrosis, one of the first things that came up in my mind was, wow, he was told when he was young that he was going to die, you know, in his 20s. And his parents were, they just wanted him to live long enough to get a driver's license, you know. And now Phil is in his mid-30s and is one of my best friends. And we love a lot of the same music grateful dead um and, uh, <laughs> um, and so um we you know we have this beautiful friendship that we would never have had in previous uh, generations because he would have been dead already and so i'm writing about the people wow. who basically made it possible for phil and other members of his generation to live you know not normal lives because they have to do a lot of sort of self-care and maintenance hours a day, really clearing their lungs of mucus and stuff like that. Um, but like the autistic community, which only became visible to itself once the definition of autism had gotten broad enough to include them, um, the cystic fibrosis uh, community only became visible enough, uh, visible to itself once people started living long enough to have blocks and to, you know, to talk and to mm. be adults together. And now they're facing something they never expected to face, which is the challenges of, oh, I'm not going to die so soon. Anyway, you know, wow. like I, I need to think about retirement or I need to think about starting a family or, you know, oh I'm going to have this life I never thought I would have. And so that's the subject of The Taste of Salt, my next book, which will probably be out in a couple of years. I'm still in the middle of writing it. Wow. This, that is ama it's amazing that they, uh, it, they are denied just by virtue of the doctors telling them you're not going to survive, what that does to the trajectory of someone's life. Right. And when it tur turns out not to be true, well, now we have to address real back to normal human problems that we all face so uh, again right. wow what what another amazing subject steve well thank I, you buddy. I, I look forward to reading that one and especially neuro tribes i i recommend to my listeners this is a subject that is not talked about enough but is prevalent in society and steve one more question here that that you just brought up in my mind we tend to diagnose individuals without a medical profession where if mm -hmm. you have a negative interaction with someone, oh, they must mm -hmm. have this. They must be a narcissist. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. must have Asperger's, right? This is mm -hmm. a very common mm – -hmm. do, you, do you strongly recommend against this or how, how should we prepare to interact with individuals who may not be like us uh, but in, an, in a humane and way that is uh, compatible with human decency? Yeah, well, I mean, one way to learn about how to treat autistic people is to read their writing. Um, uh, there's a, another excellent book out there called What Your Autistic Child Wish, Wishes You Knew. Um, oh, you know, basically learn from them. It's like, you know, how did the world learn how not to treat gay people as, you know, silly faggots and uh, et cetera? They listen to the voices of gay people. So I would say, mm -hmm. you know, listen to the voices of neurodivergent uh, people, as they're called, and also just kind of, you know, be polite, be compassionate, you know, and if someone is clearly not um, enjoying a conversation, maybe back off a bit, you know, mm -hmm. and um, uh, many of the things that 
that are widely believed about autistic people, such as, you know, the belief that they lack empathy, they're just not true. And um, there's a uh, there's a wonderful um, autistic researcher in uh, Europe named uh, Damien Milton, who um, has coined the term the double empathy problem, which is that it's not that autistic people lack empathy. It's that autistic people and neurotypical people have trouble recognizing empathy in each other. And uh, there's, a, mm. there's a researcher in America named Noah Sasson who collaborates with an autistic researcher named Monique Both Botha. And they study the dental empathy problem and it's a real thing. In other words, it's not just a one-sided deficit or impairment. It's um, in a sense, talking across different cultures. So how do we learn to translate wow. the experience of one culture into terms that another culture can understand? That's what I've tried to do with neurotribes. And, and how do we communicate and, with other tribes? I like yes. that. And I want to say, Dash, I'm a huge fan of yours uh, as well. I, I saw your uh, TikToks, I think. And I'm not, by the way, a, a big TikToker, but it might have been uh, another young person who was uh, Harry Sasson, I think, who might have tweeted something. But anyway, uh, your content is awesome. And I, I so appreciate the role that young voters are playing in, you know, saving us from... <laughs> from actual fascism. So thank you. I appreciate those comments, Steve. And the young people will continue to show up. And now that we've done our job, it's time for the government to do their job because there are more issues other than fascism. We have climate mm -hmm. change. We mm -hmm. have uh, an economy that is very tumultuous. And so mm -hmm. we need to hold our politicians accountable no matter who they are. But very grateful for the results of this last election. I, I will say that <laughs> we Me got the too. good, the good tribe in yeah. the Senate majority. So yeah. Steve, yeah. thank you so much for coming on. This was a blast and very insightful. And hopefully we will speak again when your new book, Taste of Salt comes out. Thank you so much, Dash. Take care. I'm honored to be here. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to follow and subscribe to the show. Help spread the word about uncovering the truth by giving us a five-star review and sharing the show with a friend. We're available on Apple, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you for listening. And as always, I will continue to uncover the truth. The Uncovering the Truth theme song was created and produced by Pokari.